am Dr. Emma Beckett. I am a food and nutrition scientist at the University of Newcastle. Um, and I'm also the Miss Frizzle of food science. Um, and I spend a lot of time on social media sharing my opinions and information about food and nutrition based around my food outfits. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming along. So you're a bit of a Twitter queen. And as such, I was hoping I could ask you a few questions about Twitter. Of course. So how long have you been on the platform? Um, well, I know that I definitely got my account in 2007 because that's written on your little profile thing. Um, but I really only started using it seriously probably in about 2014 um, when I kind of restarted with a bit more purpose where before I was probably just posting memes and, you know, not very um, actively using it. And why did you jump back on again? Um, I went to a science communication conference um, and a lot of people at the conference uh, were talking about uh, using Twitter for networking um, and as a way to meet uh, other people in their field um, and to meet people in the traditional media. Um, and so a lot of them were exchanging Twitter handles as a way of connecting with each other. So I thought, I've got a Twitter handle, maybe I'll do that too. <laughs> Cool. And you've, um, what I've noticed is since then, you've kind of zoomed and you've been doing it with flying colours. So what, um, how often would you say you use Twitter? Yeah, it's definitely evolved. Um, I was definitely using it less regularly to start with. Um, and now I don't think there is a day that goes by when I'm not on Twitter. Um, so at least one post a day and most days, multiple posts. Do you think that to be active on Twitter, you need to post as often as you do? I think not necessarily as often as I do. I'm definitely a, a high volume user, um, but you do need to post regularly to get the most out of it because um, Twitter works on an algorithm for interactions. And if you're not um, posting things regularly or interacting with other people regularly, then the algorithm isn't going to bump you into people's feeds. And so you're not going to get as many people seeing what you're doing and then interacting with you. Um, and also there's a lot of people on Twitter. So if you're not there regularly, um, it's very easy for other people to kind of swamp those conversations and, and for you not to be able to keep up and, you know, you don't want to be going back to a, a comment where someone tried to have an interaction with you, you know, six weeks ago, um, and then you're answering and that conversation's kind of done and dusted in their mind. They're not really going to be um, on top of what you're talking about anymore at that point. So it's a bit like a news cycle in that regard. Things sort of start and then it shifts through. And if you go back because you haven't been on Twitter for a while and things pop up, going back and sort of revisiting that isn't necessarily the best way to engage. Yeah, because you're not going to get that interaction. So, you know, sometimes I'll get people comment on a very old post of mine and I'll, I'll get the notification in amongst the stream of the current conversations. And if, you know, I've got limited time to respond to people, I'm definitely going to focus on responding to the people who are talking about what, what I was thinking about right now and trying to, you know, reset those conversations and, and go back over old ground can be quite difficult. Cool. Okay, so... I know that you're a Twitter regular because I follow you and that's actually how we met through Twitter. But how would you describe your brand in regard to Twitter and your voice and the tone you use? So my Twitter, I think one of the key things about my Twitter is it isn't just a broadcast Twitter. It's not, you know, do it yourself, regular media. It really is quite interactive. I spend a lot of time answering questions um, and really engaging with people and their comments on my posts. Um, I'm a very lighthearted um, kind of Twitter, but with an educational twist, I guess. Um, you know, I try and stay away from the serious and the controversial um, and try and, you know, focus on, uh, you know, where I can add joy and where I can add information along with that joy. So, um, you know, each morning I do my outfit selfie and I've got my food themed earrings. Today I've got broccoli. Um, and this morning my post was about how, um, all these foods that we see as different foods, broccoli, cabbage, um, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, that they're all actually the same plant, just cultivated with different selections for different features. So I use that kind of 
daily thing that I'm doing in wearing my Miss Frizzle outfits um, to try and share a bit of information and, you know, make things a little bit fun and really blow the boundaries, like to meet people where they're at. I, I try not to be a science account. I try to be a person who does science and incorporates that into their life and their conversations. Yeah, and I think you do that well because you do give out little facts each day about, you know, you might, in regard to your outfit today, you might showcase bananas because I can see bananas are on the top of your outfit and you'll give me a little fact about what bananas are and how they got to where they are or why they're good for you and I find that really interesting because it's often stuff that makes me think differently about what I'm eating that day but not necessarily in a judging way. Yeah, and I try to make it more than just a fact. Like you don't want to just keep, you know, sending more information out there for people. You want to kind of show them where the the confusion came from or where the misinformation comes from and and show them where that information fits in with their life rather than just going, here's more news, here's something you should know. And sometimes it's a did you know kind of fun fact, but other times it's very much like my opinion of we need to stop doing this, we need to stop being judgmental or we need to focus on this more or stop listening to the people who are giving you the bad advice. So, yeah, it's not just information, it's also kind of that editorial side of things, I guess. And you mentioned earlier about broadcast, um, sort of broadcast Twitter versus engagement Twitter. And how would you personally define the differences between those two? Yeah, so a lot of people will jump on Twitter and think that this is their do-it-yourself, you know, broadcast where, you know, they put out, here's my new paper and here's what I think. And then they never respond to what people say, or they never comment on other people's stories, or they never retweet what other people are talking about. Um, And those accounts can sometimes get get some good um, followings and engagements. Uh, But really, it's a lot more work to get engagements and following with that kind of account, because you're only giving people in one direction, they can get broadcast media in lots of places already what social media has it's in the name social. So you you really need to give people that social connection back. Um, And you know, my real idea is social media is the place where scientists can meet non-scientists and it means we can learn things from non-scientists as well as them learning things from us so what what people talk about on Twitter when it comes to food and nutrition really gives me a lot of my ideas of what I'm going to write about in the media or what research I'm going to do or what I might tweet about tomorrow so it really really is a two-way street and if you're not using it as a two-way street I really have to question what it is you're doing there um, and what your intent is and what my role is in your Twitter feed uh, because it it is supposed to be social. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, So in regard to your Twitter, what is one of the best experiences you've received from your Twitter and what sort of opportunities have arrived out of you actually being on Twitter? Oh, gosh, I've been very lucky from good experiences on Twitter. Um, I've had experiences in uh, getting connections with editors and producers for TV, radio, magazines and newspapers that have turned into paid opportunities to appear or write a piece. Um, I've met mentors on social media, um, senior researchers from other universities that I wouldn't have had contact with otherwise. Um, Being on a regional campus, um, it's always very important to me to be able to connect to people in in the big city, which is, you know, physically very distant for me, but Twitter kind of makes that distance smaller. Um, And I've also had lots of amazing opportunities uh, to connect with people for other kinds of opportunities where, um, you know, someone might need a a guest speaker for their community event or um, someone might have a daughter who's really struggling to you know drown out the the diet nonsense of of their peer group and you know getting to make those connections with people I think is one of the really most most rewarding parts and also I met you on Twitter Em. You did meet me on Twitter and that was really surprising because yeah we've worked together since then so some yeah it's amazing things can come out of Twitter um And it's so amazing when you get to meet Twitter people in real life. It's a massive icebreaker for conferences. Mm. Being able to walk into the room and go, I know who's here because we've talked about it on Twitter. Or, hi, we haven't met before, but we follow each other on Twitter. It's a really great icebreaker uh, when you're, you're trying to break into that networking space and you're feeling a little awkward. 
I also find that with conferences, there's also um, like an undercurrent or a back channel going on on Twitter at the same time. So you might be at the conference and you might be listening to the talks and maybe discussing discussing things during breaks and all that sort of stuff. But then also on top of that is this back channel going on on Twitter where people are sort of live tweeting at the same time about their thoughts and opinions. Have you experienced that? Yeah, it's really good to be able to live tweet at conferences. For me, I find it as, as a tool that helps me concentrate at the conference to be able to or to need to crystallise what I'm listening to into that small sound bite really makes me focus and you know be an active listener rather than a passive listener. Um, but it also means we get to share what's going on at, in the conferences more widely. Um, this whole idea of, you know, academia is the ivory tower and normal people can't get in uh, but you get to have these conversations with people you know in the breakouts and in in the the conference spaces when they they you know saw your comment and they want to talk about it more or vice versa you can find out who you want to talk to through those comments so yeah it's a really good tool to use at conferences um, if you use it well you've also mentioned to me previously that you got a conversation piece out of Twitter how did that turn out like how did that begin and start I've and got evolve? a few conversation pieces yeah I've had a few come a few conversation pieces come from Twitter um, mostly they come from me having a rant um, and you know something happens out in the world and I do my quick quick Twitter rant about you know how that's not quite right and you know I'm a bit bit annoyed that the, the the media is doing this or someone's out there promoting something um, and then a, an editor will see my comment and say don't rant write a conversation piece um, or write an editorial for my newspaper so yeah they see your opinions and say that's an opinion I'd like to see articulated a little bit further in 800 words in in my publication so yeah some great opportunities like that can can come from it and sometimes it's not the things you you thought would get picked up that that become uh, those, those published pieces. And, you know, that's a good way to, to, you know, take those ideas wider because not everyone is on Twitter. Some people are looking to the mainstream media to get that information. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's sometimes surprising the things that they, they want you to talk about. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I feel as someone who's been on Twitter for quite a while that there are those opportunities available and you don't have to put a big effort in. I know you do because I've been next to you when you've been tweeting and you sometimes tweet, you know, 12 or 15 times a day, which to me is like beyond extreme for someone like me. I might tweet, you know, once every two or three days. Um, but I've seen the opportunities that are available and I think that people who aren't on Twitter don't realise that they're missing those because they're not on Twitter. So in regard to other platforms, I know you're also on Facebook and you're also, what else do you have? Instagram. How, do your, how does your tone differ between each of those platforms and does it differ at all? So sometimes your content will be similar across the platforms, um, but it is yeah, quite different for each of them. So on um, Twitter, it's very much, that's my primary platform. That's where I'll start each morning with my outfit selfie. And that's where I'll kind of put my thoughts throughout the day. If, if you know, I've got a, 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 a thought bubble that I want to share with people, I'll, I'll put it on Twitter throughout the day. So that's very dynamic. People re reply what quite quickly it changes a lot um, what the focus is um, on the platform whereas Instagram is pretty much I'll do my outfit selfie in the morning and if I see something pretty or fun or interesting or you know science quirky throughout the day then I'll do another one um, so today I did my outfit selfie this morning and there was a beautiful cloud formation above the quadrangle while I was relaxing and looking up at the sky at lunchtime um, so I put that on Instagram as well um, so Instagram is a lot less interactive because the, the comments just sit on your post. Whereas on Twitter, your comments and replies to other people and their comments and replies to you will pop up in other people's feeds. So you get more people kind of joining the conversation in Twitter, whereas Instagram is kind of you post and then everyone replies to you. Um, Facebook is my least regular posting platform. Um, on Facebook, I'll, I'll post when I have something kind of more polished to say. So Facebook is where I'll share an article I've written with a little explainer as to why I've written the article, or I'll make a little infographic kind of slide of something that I've been thinking about that's been annoying me or, or that I've been wondering 
about or people have been asking me about. Um, and then probably my best outfit selfies, the ones that get the most um, traction on, on Instagram or, or Twitter will be ones that I'll, I'll do on Facebook as well. So, but yeah, definitely kind of the launching pad is, is Twitter. Um, and then the Facebook is the more polished version because because you're targeting different people, right? Like Twitter is for other scientists. It's for everyday people. Um, it's for uh, producers and editors. Whereas Instagram, I'm more connecting with uh, non-scientists. Instagram is all about the aesthetics. And by using the the outfits, I can get people who are not at all interested in science paying attention to science. So that's a bit of a capture, a different audience than Twitter. Um, whereas Facebook is kind of more the, the, I don't even know how to say it. Facebook's more, it's more heterogeneous in who you're capturing, but you're capturing people through people. So most people who follow you on Facebook to start with have a connection to you and then people will follow who are connected to them and you get kind of this filtering out effect, whereas Twitter's a lot more, people are everywhere and they're, they're coming from all the places. I also feel like Facebook these days is potentially a bit more curated and I think that... Um, what Twitter is now is what Facebook used to be, where you used to, on Facebook, you used to say what's on your mind and you'd add that throughout the day. Whereas now I feel like Facebook is a little bit more planned. It's a little bit more thought out. People might only be on there once a day. Whereas I think Twitter is, because it's that constant news feed, you can just jump on for two minutes or 20 minutes and and have your, your fill for the day. Mm -hmm. I think that is a really good point. And I feel like if I posted on Facebook as regularly as I posted on Twitter, people would put me on mute. <laughs> they would be, this girl is posting so much about science and nutrition and I don't want to hear it anymore. It's all that's in my feed. Um, so, yeah, I think you're definitely right. Whereas Twitter, that's very acceptable and probably what people are looking for, um, probably not what people are looking for on Facebook so much anymore. In regard to your your outfit selfies in the morning and your selfie posts, how much time does that take you each day? Oh, barely any. Um, so I basically just get dressed in whatever I'm, I'm thinking of wearing, um, which often has to do with what's ironed and, you know, how recently I've worn a pair of earrings because I try to cycle through them. Um, and normally as I'm driving to work, I think about what, what in information goes with my outfit and then when I get to work I do a quick selfie in my office and um and just post it while I'm drinking my coffee in the morning so yeah I try not to let it get I don't plan them or anything I don't have a list or or any any kind of thing I try and keep it spontaneous um and some mornings I'm just like uh I'm too tired for a fun fact today but aren't my earrings cute and people yep. seem to be okay with that um or some days I might pick an outfit because something particular is going on um, so like I hosted a round table on mushrooms, so I wore a mushroom outfit or I gave a talk on whole grains. So I wore a grain based outfit. Um, so sometimes I'll pick based on, you know, the day's activities or themes fruity Friday on Fridays. I always wear fruit. Um, that's something that started on Instagram with some of the fruit, fruit earring makers. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't put a, it probably looks like you put a lot of time into it, but, but I really don't. I'm it's, it's very much a spontaneous, you know, fun start to the day kind of thing. I kept doing it while we were working from home uh, through through the, the peak of the pandemic so far. I kept doing it as a way to kind of, you know, stimulate myself in the morning and, um, yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fun to, to use it as a way of centering yourself, switching on um, and thinking of that fun fact first thing in the morning or that little bit of information I want to share with people really reminds me why I do what I do and so that makes it a really rewarding and inspiring start to the day to be able to go yeah I'm sharing this with people um, and that kind of you know gets me going for some of the the less fun work that I need to do to to get by yeah all the admin <laughs> um, and what I've discovered because I've known you for a few years now is that this sort of food outfit thing has also evolved so when you first um, we first started working together you kind of wore bright colors you actually had a lot of color in your hair at that point and you told me that's partially because you're an identical twin so you were trying to to separate yourself in that regard but then what I've noticed over time is that you are really 
almost like the more you're doing this, the more you're doing this. So this is sort of like your brand has evolved around your passion into somewhere that you probably couldn't have planned for. Yeah, I was definitely always a bright dresser. And then uh, one of my old friends um, designed a fruit dress. Um, she was the artist who drew the fabric and she did a fruit dress and she did a donut dress. Um, and I bought both of those and because they were bright and because they were fun. Um, and then lots of people started going, oh, that's really cool because you're a food scientist. And I was like, yeah, I am a food scientist. This does work. Um, and then once you kind of share one of them on Instagram, more of them pop up in your feed. And then it gets a little bit <laughs> like a self-fulfilling prophecy and you have to buy them all. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. And I think when I first started wearing food dresses, I would only wear them on special occasions. They'd be my conference outfit or my you know frock on Friday outfit um, and I had this real idea at the beginning that academia was this serious place where I needed to look like an academic um, and as I started wearing more and more food dresses I realized I don't need to look like an academic I can definitely wear food dresses and then it became a way to start a conversation with non-scientists and people in the supermarket would stop me and be like wow cool dress and I'd be like thanks actually do you know I'm a food scientist and that's why I wear this and then they'd say I didn't know food scientist was a job. What do you do? And then that would start a conversation with someone who'd never even thought about food as a science before. And then I realized that that's what charlatans do in the nutrition space on, on social media. They do their beautiful selfie of them in the bikini. And then because they look great, you'll buy their nutrition advice, even though it's nonsense. And then I thought, well, if they're doing it, why don't I do it, but use that superpower for good? And then it just escalated from there and just became this whole thing where, you know, it, it's, it started out as, you know, a couple of times a week. And then now it's literally every, every day. And I went to a wedding recently and I had to borrow a non-food dress from my twin sister because I literally had nothing sensible to wear. Um, so one of the benefits of having a twin sister um, and definitely I escalated it through through the pandemic. Um, I definitely got more regular in doing the selfies through the pandemic. I probably was wearing food outfits every day before that. But during the pandemic, it became this real self-affirmation of like being me, even though I wasn't out in the world. And I also went through this crisis of selfness because my um, I couldn't do the colours in my hair during COVID because you couldn't go to the the hairdresser I'd look in the mirror and I'd see my twin sister but if I was in a food outfit I saw me so it became very much about who I was um and yeah I've kind of just leaned into it and it's it's become a an identifying a feature and yeah it's become a thing and and now I kind of can't stop but I kind of don't mind because it's it's great fun um in regard to that if, what do you like so if you're you work in a lab I know that um you teach you work in a lab you you know, you do all the research, you do all the things. Uh, what do you wear when you're in the lab? I wear this, but with a lab coat over the top. So exact same outfit, but with PPE. And I feel like I've seen photos of you, but not in a white lab coat. No, my lab coat is pink. Um, I have a pink lab coat and a purple lab coat um, my pink lab coat is for teaching and for RNA work and my purple lab coat is for DNA work um, and that way pink stands out in a sea of white lab coated students um, and it also means that when I'm doing my different types of work DNA and RNA you don't want them cross contaminating each other it means that I don't actually accidentally get my lab coats confused but also means no one will steal my lab coat in the in the <laughs> lab like and wear it when they shouldn't be Cool. Um, back to Fruity Friday, which is a thing now for you. I have seen those and I've seen them on Insta and I've seen them on Facebook and I have also seen them on Twitter, but in which we're talking about Twitter at the moment. So let's get on to hashtags because I know you now hashtag Fruity Friday. What is your suggestion or advice around hashtags in regards to Twitter? So I probably don't use hashtags as much as I should. Um, I don't like wasting my character limit. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm really cramming as much as I can into those characters. Um, I do the, the Fruity Friday hashtag. That is my most regular one um, because that kind of is a thing. Other people do it as well. And it's a way of kind of the community connecting to each other. Um, during the pandemic, I well, the pandemic's still going on, but while we're working from home, I did um, 
uh, you know, dopamine dressing. That was a hashtag that a lot of people were doing and that was a way to connect with people. Um, but I used hashtags a lot more when I was new on the socials because hashtags are a way of getting you into other people's feeds. So, you know, if it was whole grain day and I'm wearing my corn earrings, I would hashtag whole grains because then people who were interested in whole grain day would find hashtag whole grains. They'd find me, then I'd get that connection out of it. Um, so it's a really good way to, to connect with people when you're starting out. And I think that's typically what you see is that, that people use them more regularly early on um, and then probably forget to as, as the tweets become a bit more conversational and organic. Um, the other time I really use them a lot is conferences. Um, so, you know, people will search the conference hashtag or the conference will um, be monitoring the hashtag and putting uh, the, the tweets up on their account or their feed or they'll have a big screen in the lunchroom where they're showing them. Um, so, yeah, hashtags can be a really good way of uh, finding other people who are interested in the same things as you, um, but they're not always necessary and also don't overdo it. When you see someone who's like, hashtag, 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 it's like, okay, well, they're new here and they need to sit, settle down. Um, you know, no more than three hashtags on Twitter is probably the general rule, um, but Instagram, people go nuts with hashtags because Instagram, because you're not popping up in, in different people's feeds with comments and things, it's just the original posts that, that pop up in followers feeds uh, Instagram you need more hashtags to be able to connect with people so Instagram definitely people use a lot more hashtags um, and you'll often see they'll do the post um, and then they'll have their image description um, for accessibility and then after that they'll have their whole series of hashtags that relate to what they're doing and you'll see people do you know a very good chunk of hashtags there um, I don't do that on Instagram just because I don't really have the time um I, I really try and keep the the posts quick and simple in the morning um you know if I started doing 50 hashtags I'd take a long time to type that on my phone in the morning um and I I kind of if you're using Instagram for business you might um have kind of your set ones that you copy and paste onto all your posts so that people can find you but for me I'm I'm not out to find followers. Like I'm interested in the more authentic connections. So I'm not, I'm not really too fast on that. So in your view, is it better to have lots of followers or better to have engagement with followers? Uh, I definitely think when it comes to followers, it's quality over quantity. Um, there's no point having 20,000 followers if you just you know, lurking at them. Uh, you really need to be able to connect with people. Um, so yeah, you don't want, you know, the fake follows. You don't want to bait people into following you and then, you know, change what you're, you're delivering on or whatever. Um, I think it definitely is. For me, it's the authenticity. It's the connections. It's the conversations. I would I'd rather have five amazing followers where, you know, we have good conversations and, you know, get good things out of being on the, the social medias together than, than have a whole whole army of them. In regard to Twitter, have you ever had any negative experiences and how have you dealt with those? I, I do think it is important to acknowledge, yes, there are negative experiences. There are some jerks out there. There are some trolls out there. Um, and there are some people with some very strong feelings on food and nutrition. Um, so, yeah, there are moments when people do want to have a go at you or, you know, they want to tear you down. They want to call me fat. They want to call me stupid. Um, they want to call me a shell for big cereal. Um, you know, th those moments all happen. Um, but I think on the whole, uh, the real, the good connections and the good moments really outweigh the negative. And if I was ever in a situation where there was more negative than positive, I would, would reconsider my my role on social media, but the positive definitely far outweighs the negative. Um, and I also, I really, I don't take those things personally. If someone calls me fat on social media, that says a lot more to me about them as a human than it does about me as a human. Um, if someone wants to, you know, critique my ethics or my qualifications, well, that's fine. They're allowed to have their opinion on, on what it is that I speak about. Um, but that really doesn't, um, you know, impact me as a person too much. So yeah, there's negatives, but 
you know, there's negatives everywhere. There's going to be jerks everywhere you go. Just they're probably a bit braver on social media than they would be in real life. But that's what the block and mute buttons are for. So it's totally fine. How do you use the block and mute buttons? Like as in how do you me- use them? Not like physically <laughs> how do you use them? You're like, well, you press the mute button and then that mutes them. And if you press the block button, but um, do you have any self-rules around blocking and muting? <laughs> yes, you just click the mem. Um, <laughs> You're like, oh, my God, how slow are you? And I'm like, yes, I have. I do the, that was a bad question. <laughs> no, right. no, that was, that, was, that was just me being silly in my interpretation. That's um okay. My rules for blocking and muting is everyone gets a genuine go at engagement because sometimes you'll think someone's being a troll or you'll think someone's being a jerk and actually they've just misunderstood your point or um, actually they uh, think they're commenting on a different thing or um, maybe they're just having a bad day. Um, So everyone gets a genuine chance. Um, I generally have a three strikes rule where I'll engage with you on face value for three attempts. And if you after three attempts, it becomes clear that you're sea lining or trolling or baiting or whatever else. Um, then I'll say, this is not a genuine engagement. I'm going now. Um, and then I'll block or mute. Um, whether I block or mute will depend on whether it's just I don't want to be distracted by it anymore or whether it's I don't want that person in my space so sometimes I will block people as a way of self-preservation because some people will just suck the oxygen out of the room and will keep going at you and if you mute them then they'll start retweeting you and calling their followers to come and have a go at you as well and a lot of the kind of diet um, factions will do that so if you mute them they'll say oh she's muted me she's not listening anymore can you guys have a go and then the rest will jump on so those ones I'll block because those ones I don't want in my space they don't deserve the the posts from me um they have no right to the posts from me I they're not entitled to my time so those ones I will block or if anyone's you know deliberately rude or offensive racist sexist homophobic transphobic any of that that will be an instant blocking uh because I just don't need that noise in my life excellent so in regard to that um how like have you ever put any information out there that has either been private or that you shouldn't have put out there or perhaps some science that you put out that you thought was right and wasn't right and then what have you done about that if you have done that Mm, so once I accidentally t- tweeted my home address um, because I took a photo of a parcel without realising and someone said, you know, you've put your home address up, take that down. Um, that was good to be warned rather than leave that out there for the whole world to see. Um, but, yeah, I've had times where I've tweeted something and someone said, oh, no, actually not quite right. Um, and sometimes you think something's right or sometimes we... We learn things, they teach us the simple but not quite right thing first and only when you get to a certain level of expertise do you find out that what they taught you at university was not actually quite correct. It was the glossed version. Um, So sometimes I've said things and then people have gone, well, actually, I'd be like, of course. Yeah, I've done the simplified version. Um, And, you know, how you respond to that will definitely depend on how it comes to you. Some people are really great at saying, yeah, absolutely, good point, but you've missed this nuance. And in that case, it's like, yes, thank you. I will amplify that now. And thank you for, for, you know, educating me on that. Some people will be jerks about it. And it's like, okay, well, cool. It was a tweet. Like I couldn't, it's not an essay. I couldn't put all that detail in. So, you know, thanks bro. Um, And, you know, sometimes information changes. So uh, at the very, very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, when there was no COVID in Australia, it was, you know, just international um my local abc radio asked me to do a video for them explaining why masks were not recommended and that was the official recommendation at that time from the cdc from the world health organization um so i um, did the video and i explained that you know there were all these reasons why we shouldn't be wearing masks at this point. Um, you know, we were talking about things like, you know, false sense of security. And we were talking about things like cleanliness because when people were new, you know, masks are old now, we all know how to wear a mask now. But at the beginning, people were doing things like, you know, sticking them in their, their bra as a pocket or, you know, wiping their nose on them or lifting them, pulling them down to cough. Um, 
And so explaining what those problems were was, was something I did a video on. Um, and then, of course, the directions changed. COVID came to Australia. The World Health Organization changed their instructions and started saying, well, yes, the viruses, the particles will fit through the holes in the fabric, but it will slow down the projection. And all those different messages came. Um, so then I said, well, guys, forget that video. But that video was out there. That was on so many Facebooks and so many people's Twitter feeds. And of course, ABC doesn't go back and delete it once it's it's, it's old. Um, so I had people coming at me and saying, well, what would you know? You're, you say masks don't work. And I had to be very clear. I, I follow the current evidence and the official guidance I don't stick to old information because I said at one time you know there's no point being stubborn about masks um so yeah sometimes you do need to say actually that's wrong now but that then becomes a teachable moment as to how science works and that the information evolves and the interpretation of information evolves um, so it's not just about the fact is right and it's always right sometimes it is that kind of interpretation situation and it will change and that is really what science is so it's it's quite okay yep I think that's a very very good example in regard to making connections through Twitter um do you think it's a good platform to be able to contact people you wouldn't normally contact or would it be better to perhaps look up their LinkedIn or their university profile and email them to make those contacts how has it worked for you and what do you recommend? Um, yeah, it probably depends on the person and the connection you're looking for. So I've had people um, look up my university profile and email me because they've seen me on social media. Um, and, you know, a student might email and say, I've seen your profile and, you know, you're someone I want to be like... Um, could we have a conversation? Could we do a Zoom meeting or um, set up some kind of mentoring arrangement um, and sometimes that's cool to, to you know take Twitter as your common point of where you know each other from and then go to a more professional or, or more personal or whatever level from there um, but I also have people who will just DM and say you know I'm thinking about this would you be interested in being a part of it um, so so it works both ways um, but I definitely think yeah it give, Twitter gives you reach to people you wouldn't normally get to connect with so you know there's a lot of professors um, in my field there's a lot of senior female academics in different fields um, who I just would not have a chance to see or run into in everyday life um, and so I get to make those connections um, and you know sometimes you will tweet and, and say hey I've got this question specifically for you and I know you're the expert um, and that's cool um, most most people are very happy to answer those kinds of questions <laughs> Um, so yeah, it works both ways. Um, LinkedIn, I'm terrible at LinkedIn. I don't, I don't quite get it because it's um, it's this weird hybrid platform where there's a, there's a feed with stories running, but there's also this kind of bio part to it, and then there's the DMs that have a whole bunch of spam and the connections you need to have connections to connections to make them, and it's to me that's very confusing. I never know where to click if I want to go back and read someone's post on on LinkedIn, um, but I am told LinkedIn is very important for the industry connections. So people who want to work in a, a science industry field, apparently that that is the space to be, and I'm trying to be better at it, but it's it doesn't come naturally to me. But everyone has their own like you know, Strengths. natural thing they have synergy with, right? Yeah. Like some people will be like, what are you talking about, Emma? LinkedIn is the most intuitive for me, but for me, it's not intuitive and, and Twitter very much is. So, LinkedIn is, I think, the way of the future in regard to professional connections. So for those people who aren't on board yet, I would recommend that you think about getting a profile and starting to learn about it because it will open up a lot of doors for you. And I think- I, I feel like LinkedIn's a bit more deliberate though. It is. You're more deliberate with wanting to make the connections, whereas on Twitter um, and Instagram, it's more I'm me and if you want to connect, cool. Yep. Where, yeah, and I've never really done the, 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 the deliberate, the targeted networking. Um, you know, I spent the first part of my career with people telling me networking, you need to know what you want. And I went, oh, but I don't want anything. I just want to talk to people. Um, well, you know what you want. You want to find out about them. That's fine. That's enough to want. But, 
but once I started seeing networking just as being you and then people would know who you were if they needed you or someone like you later. Um, and for me, that's what Twitter is. Twitter is just being there and being you and people will see you and ask you if they have an opportunity. Whereas LinkedIn, I feel like you've got to be a bit more deliberate and I'm very much a falling through life, taking opportunities person. I'm not a I'm not a strategic person yet. I'm not trying yet. to I don't learn. know. I don't know. I think maybe you're a naturally strategic person. I think LinkedIn's kind of interesting because it's probably, it's a couple of things in there. One is that it's a, a fully professional platform. It's like Facebook for your career, if that makes sense. So it is more curated. It is more considered. And I think that it's also where Twitter is so fast, it evolves a lot quicker. So I think that LinkedIn is just moving at a slower rate. Mm. So I think that it will get to the point where people feel more comfortable about sharing their entire brand on there instead of just their curated, this is my this is my shiny profile of the sort of work I do. Mm. And it will become more realistic and more human the more it grows. And I think possibly you need to push past the imposter syndrome a little bit more for, for, for LinkedIn because yeah. it is that kind of more professional, more polished. And so maybe I feel a little bit less comfortable with it because I haven't passed that barrier of imposter syndrome yet because I'm still like, who are these people on Twitter and why are they interested in what I've got to say? I, I still every day am in awe that anyone likes my selfies and that anyone is interested in these these facts that I put out there so and opinions that I put so out I think, there. So, yeah, maybe I'm not quite there yet. Such a good attitude to have, though. As soon as you get into the space where you're like, why aren't people following me? I think that you've completely misunderstood what engagement is and you've turned back into broadcast or back into... Uh, I'm owed this. And as soon as you're in that space, people pick that up and then they shut down on you and they're not interested anymore. And it is absolutely no fun if you're doing it to chase followers. Like followers for followers sake is, that's a, that's not fun. That's, that's a really, you know, dry hard way work. to do things. Yeah, it is hard work. Um, and for what? Like, unless you're going to flip your account and sell it to, you know, some spam account or something, like literally what's the point of just building for build's sake? Um, so yeah, for me, it's much more about just doing what you do. And if people are interested, they'll be interested. And if they're not interested, they're not your people. All about sharing the passion. Yeah. I think that's great. All right, so I'm going to ask you some quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, what are your tips on how to pick a Twitter handle? Oh, okay. I wish I'd thought about this a lot harder. Um, think about uh, can you harmonize your handles across your accounts? I have a different handle in every account and I should have thought harder about that. So when you say different accounts, you mean Facebook versus, versus Insta versus um, Twitter? Yeah, so if you can say, you know, I'm I'm at Dr. Emma Beckett on all the platforms, people can find you easily, but I have a different, literally have a different handle for every, every account. And I regret that, but I feel like it's too late to go back now. Um, don't put too many numbers at the end of your name. The auto-generated ones will put a string of numbers to make it unique. Um, that's pretty much the, the universal signal of it's a bot account or it's a brand new account um, and those uh, accounts are kind of treated with caution by experienced users. I have numbers at the end of mine. Again, I regret that. Only three of them though. I would definitely not have more than three numbers uh, at the end of your handle, uh, but make it something easy to remember, make it something uniquely you and do not put an underscore at the start. If you put an underscore at the start, no one's ever going to be able to search you and be like, oh, I remember that um, person's name started with a J. They would have to search underscore as that first thing for you to kind of pop up in your in your feed so underscores make it super hard to find on search if you're going to use an underscore in your handle put it in the middle or at the end not at the beginning excellent what are your top tips on photos and videos and that sort of media so photos and videos definitely get more engagement so the more visual you can be the more likely someone is to stop on the scroll and see you um, Videos, the shorter, the better is the general rule. Um, and for pictures and for videos, try and keep them accessible. Use those alt texts and those image descriptions so that everyone um, can be involved in it. I didn't think to start with that alt text was important for me because I thought, well, if you can't see my outfit, I, is this really the post for you? Um, and I felt like a bit of a 
tool describing my outfits um, in the post. And uh, then one of my friends suggested that I should be being accessible with my posts and include the alt text. Um, and people have actually written back um, who I didn't even know needed the alt text or wanted the alt text to say, thank you for including that. We visually impaired also like to enjoy an outfit selfie. Um, so that's that's been really important to me and something that it took me a little while to get in the habit to remember to do it. Um, but now is definitely part of my everyday. So keep them accessible, keep them short. Um, but definitely, yeah, pictures do help get people to, to engage. And you add that alt text and you want to explain what alt text is to start with? So alt text. Is yes. So the alt the alt text is just a little descriptor where um, it says what's in the picture. So if someone can't see the picture, um, if they're using a, a screen reader, um, they can have the, the description read out. Um, and you, you, get, you can choose what to put, put in there. Um, so, you know, for my outfit selfies, I'll explain who I am as a human first, you know, that I'm smiling and those kinds of things so that the people know what, what I'm doing in those photos. Excellent. And does the alt text cut into your character limit? No, the alt text is not part of the character limit. It's a separate thing. Um, you basically click on the photo as you're putting the photo up and there's a little icon in the corner that says alt and you add it in there. It still has its own limit. I think it's about a thousand characters. Um, pictures worth a thousand words. A thousand yeah, characters. I like that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about a thousand characters, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't cut into your text. How would you select a good profile picture? Oh, interesting question. Profile pictures. Um, I recommend to have a profile picture for your personal account or your professional personal account that shows your face. Um, people definitely feel like it's a more genuine engagement if they can see who you are. Um, some people will have um, avatars like cartoon pictures of themselves. Um, some people do tweet anonymously they tweet as a persona um, about you know certain ideas and more controversial things um, they might have pictures and and those kinds of things that, that describe who they are um, I think the real rule with profile pictures is just have one if someone doesn't have a profile picture that's a red flag as to is this a genuine account or is this an account someone's just set up for this engagement so as long as you have a profile picture probably good um but yeah for i i gen generally um spend a lot more time speaking to people who have actual photos of themselves so i know who i'm talking to can you tell me what would make or what you think a good bio is for twitter Oh, a good bio. Um, I don't know if mine's good, but my bio um, has what I do um, so that I'm a scientist. Um, it's got the Miss Frizzle of food science in there so that people understand what they see when they see my dresses. Um, I've got a few of kind of my highlight interests in there. Um, you don't need to write that whole opinions are mine and not my employers. That like literally means nothing. Um, so don't waste your precious bio characters on that. Um, again, just have a bio. Um, you know, I've got the link out to my website so that people could find out more about me. And I've got my Facebook and my Instagram handles up there as well so that people who want to cross platforms can. Um, but yeah, again, have a bio. Um, some people have some really hilarious bios where I'm like, oh, I'll follow them. They sound funny. Um, and other people have very very factual bios where they say you know what their political leaning is and where they live and you know those those kinds of things um for science you can use remember you can use hashtags in the bio so that if people search the hashtag you come up as a person who uses that hashtag um so that can be a good way um to make connections with the right people early on but yeah i think the golden rule is just have one in regard to twitter do you think that it's important just to have a professional Twitter and a, a personal Twitter? What's your view on that? So I like to have the hybrid account. I like to be 
Emma the human and Emma the scientist. So, you know, I will post about my cats and my family and my sports and and all those things as well as my science. And there is, for me, nothing more satisfying than when one of my football friends comments on a science post or when one of my science friends comments on a football post. Um, so for me, that kind of hybrid account gives you the opportunity to um, blur the boundaries and not have this whole scientist is expert and other people are normal um, and people think we're all these like awkward nerds who can't speak to people and you know some of us are that's cool um, but people have this very stereotypical idea of scientists and experts and there's the whole anti-expert sentiment and for me having the the personal and the professional together gives me an opportunity to show people that scientists are people too because people trust people people don't trust positions titles qualifications um, so I think more people trust what I say on Twitter because they know me on Twitter than trust me because I have five degrees so you know just saying I've got five degrees isn't enough if they don't know who I am and what I stand for as a person um, so I like to have both I know that some people like to keep the personal out of it and like to be purely professional that's okay too and I know that some people like to be purely personal and keep the professional out of it that's okay too. Um, but I'd say if you're new at it, think about who you want to be. Do you want this to be a professional account or do you want it to be a, a personal or a hybrid account? Um, and then you can kind of set your own boundaries as to what you're comfortable to share and talk about. Excellent. Final one, what, do you, what are your tips about tagging people into posts? Oh, so tagging people. A few general rules um don't snitch tag so snitch tagging is when someone will post about something without involving the person they're talking about so often that's a you know controversial kind of situation where someone's like oh I can't believe this person did this said this or you know I definitely disagree with this point of view um, and then snitch tagging is when someone says oh hey at whoever did you see this person said this about you? Um, and it brings that person into the conversation when clearly the person had made a deliberate plan not to speak to them. And that can get a little bit awkward. It's kind of like, you know, if we were having a conversation and I was saying, oh, I'm really not comfortable about what this person said. And you went, oh, they're over here. Let's ask them what they think. Like you wouldn't do that in real life, right? So don't, don't do it with tags. Um, Tagging is also um, a good way to promote other people, lift other people up, um, you know, say um, this person said this and I agree with it rather than like claiming that idea as your own um, is really good. Retweeting people and tagging them so that um, it stays in their engagement um, is, is something else that you might want to think about doing. Um, but one thing you want to think about when you get more followers and I learned this the hard way. Um, I tagged someone just because they said something and I thought it was great. And I was like, oh, everyone, you know, blah, blah, just said this. And they were like, oh, I can't keep up now. And I'd taken my 20,000 followers and then they were all replying to this, this mutual of mine who only had like 50 followers and she just was not used to the volume of replies. And she was like, don't tag me again. Don't ever tag me again. Too that swamped. was too much. Um, yeah, so if, if you think you're being helpful in, in tagging someone, um, consider what their personality and their mode of use on the platform is first. Um, and maybe um, there's some situations where you should say, oh, do you mind if I tag you? Um, and, and that can, you know, make that situation a little bit easier. But generally, yeah, tagging people to lift people up, great. Tagging people to criticise them and tear them down, um, you're probably just asking for trouble. What is your view on, um, yeah, it's gone, it's doing so well. But I have so many views. I know. What is your view on, you're like, let me finish that sentence for you. My view, <laughs> oh, there we go. If you had to do give, a, I don't know, 30 second, two minute pitch to a researcher as to why they should use Twitter and why it will help them, go. All right, I have no concept of time, so this is hard for me. Stop if I get to two minutes. Um, 
using Twitter is a really great way to connect with the people that your research is for. So a lot of us do publicly funded research. Uh, a lot of us want the public to fund research more. Um, and if we can show people what we're doing, uh, they're more interested in doing that. Um, we definitely live in a world of anti-expert sentiment and uh, part of uh, building that kind of public profile as a researcher um, really helps to break down those barriers and help people trust us more and not just see us as boffins in ivory towers and all those things that people say that only people in ivory towers would say. Um, and also it's it's fun, like it's, it's motivating and it, it reminds you of why you do what you do. Um, and the other important thing is you learn stuff. You, <laughs> we get very isolated and siloed and, you know, caught up in our own uh, specialty expert um, siloed space in academia and so you know reaching out and meeting different people and finding out what they think about what you do um, can be very eye-opening and can give you opportunities and ideas for for future research and engagement nice how so long was that I don't know I don't know I didn't really time you <laughs> but uh, all right so who do you follow in regard to science who do you put up there and say these scientists or researchers are doing a good job when it comes to Australian science I hate this question because I will always forget someone and there's so many and you know you try and think of the ones off the top of your head and then you're like oh I forgot this person um and you know that happens on um Twitter as well where people do things like follow Friday where you share the accounts you really like to tell your friends to follow them as well and I always feel like I'm going to leave someone out um but there's some really good ones that that come come to mind um I really like um Astro Kirsten Astro Kristen, oh, I've done it again. I never know it's Kristen or Kirsten. Um, that, that's me and my brain, not because I don't love her. Um, but she does um, TikTok and she shares all her best TikToks on, on, on Twitter. Um, and I feel like I don't need to be on TikTok because all the best ones are on Twitter. Um, so she's got lots of videos. It's very dynamic. Um, it's very fun. Um, I like um, Where Is Daz. Um, he's um, former associate professor of biomedical science and now a, a real media scientist. Um, and, you know, he does a lot of... Um, and this really is Darren Saunders, isn't it? Takedowns. Yeah, yeah. Um, when people are talking nonsense about science, Daz calls it out and I really like that. Um, and I also like um, Gid MK, um, health nerd. Um, he um, is an epidemiologist. He's he's done really well on Twitter through um, the pandemic because people know what epidemiologists are now um, and what they do, exactly. um, though they think it is all about infectious diseases. Um, someone asked me the other day why I studied epidemiology before a pandemic. And I was like, wait, do you think epidemiology is just pandemics? It's just been it's invented. So <laughs> But Gid's done a lot of really great stuff um, on the on the pandemic and the pandemic science and how evidence is interpreted. Um, and he's really engaged the general public um, really, really well um, and really walked a very fine line of, um, you know, taking the mick out of the misinformation, but at the same time bringing the good, clear information. Because you do want to be careful that you don't, you know, reinforce a myth by by spending too much time on it. Um, and I think he walks that line really well. But there's so many more, like Dr. Carl's on Twitter. Um, and Dr. Carl writes back, like, you know, you can tweet Dr. Carl and be like, hey, Dr. Carl, what, why does this happen? Um, and he'll write back, or if he doesn't know, he'll retweet it and get, you know, other people involved in answering. Um, or if he says something and you're like, mm, Dr. Carl, no, he will retweet you and be like, oh, actually an expert in this field has just um, told me that that's not quite correct. Um, so he's really dynamic um, and really fun. Um, and yeah, there's so many great people. So, and it, it becomes, you know, you follow one really cool person and you'll see who they're following and who they're talking to and it becomes a, a whole network. So yeah, those are the ones that, that come to mind quickly. Um, and, but there's so many more. It's Astro Kirsten, I'm sure now. It's come come in my head. I'm terrible, Kirsten Kristen. Sorry, all you people with that name. It's my fault, not yours. So that's been really great. Thank you for talking to me, Emma. It's uh, to have someone who's been on the platform and is doing really, really well and has sort of built their brand as they've gone along is a really interesting 
journey to be with you on. I've followed you all the way through, but I think it's really good for the people listening to this video to, to find out about, you know, you don't have to go in there with a, a social media plan. It evolves with you. You don't have to go in there as pure scientist. You don't have to go in there as research only and that opportunities open up for you that you may never have even thought of and you'll connect with people you may never have even considered we're interested in what you do. Is there any final parting words you want to leave to the researchers who are considering Twitter? Yeah, I guess I, I honestly did not know what opportunities were there for me on Twitter when I first joined. Um, and I really did join, you know, to connect with those people I'd met at that conference. And, you know, I was thinking very, very short term and specific when I did it. Um, and really it's grown so much from there. Um, and, so yeah, don't, I guess, guess my advice is when you're new at it, don't overthink it. Um, you know, the saying dance like no one's watching for Twitter. It's the opposite. The, the advice when you start out is tweet like everyone's reading it and just act like you have an audience and uh, then people will interact with you. And just when you start out, don't worry if you don't get likes or you don't get shares but spend time commenting on other people's posts, spend time retweeting other people's work, show them that you're interested, introduce yourself. Don't be a spammy pest, um, but, you know, engage with people uh, early on and then that engagement grows organically. You don't, uh, you don't need to force it, but have patience. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you.